breaker of the glass ceiling, pioneer of disability rights in America, member of the Socialist Party? Who might, you ask, am I referring to? Friends, it's none other than Helen Keller. That's right. There's a lot more to her than some of you may know. She is, of course, part of the cultural zeitgeist in America. Let's find out more today about the writer, leader of disability rights, overall human rights activist, kind of, uh, <laughs> Helen Keller on another episode of The Remedial Scholar. That's ancient history. I feel I was denied, critical, need to know information. Belongs in a museum, 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 museum. Stop skipping your remedial class. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Remedial Scholar. If you're new here, thank you for joining us. Tell us two truths and a lie. Just kidding. Uh, not a real classroom, but aren't those just so anxiety-inducing? I have never liked that activity ever. And never once have I felt that I walked away from it learning more about people. But anyway, we're not doing that. <laughs> um, I'm excited for this one and excited to have you all here with me. Before we get into the biggest phony of all time... Uh, quick announcements, as always. Stickers are available. Email me, remedialscholar at gmail.com, or message me on the Facebook if you're interested. Uh, be about $2.50 a piece, and that's delivered and all. So you can order, I mean, I only have 50, but <laughs> you can order a bunch, and I'll just mail them to you. No, uh, no shipping included. Other merch, the t-shirts are available, prints available as well. Uh, the Marie Antoinette Heads Will Roll was probably one of my favorite designs. I ordered a couple myself and I'm very excited. Also, thank you for the continued reviews and ratings at all locations, Podchaser, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. Communicate it with other fans as well on Facebook and in the Facebook group. You know, share memes and talk about the episodes. And I think that's it. Time to get into it. Helen, of course, is one of the most famous women in American history, conquering her disabilities to become educated at high levels and even become an author. She's not the first and is definitely not the last deafblind person to ever exist, but I believe her to be a inspiring uh, tale nonetheless. The disjointed theme of Halloween will be <laughs> slightly askew. I was inspired to do this episode because of the very real thought that is circulating around the internet that she is fake or her, her disability is fake. So, if I know you personally and we've ever had this conversation, just know that this entire episode is stunk on you. Not really, but kind of. No, just to illuminate and hopefully explain the mystery a bit, you know, better than maybe your elementary school did, because I'm pretty sure that's the last time I learned about Helen was, you know, in like third grade. So, this episode's going to be pretty straightforward, biography style, similar to Joan of Arc or the Dumpolian episode. So, yeah, you know, birth, death, everything else, pretty chronological. So, Let's go. Helen was born on the 27th of June in 1880 in West Tuscumbia, Alabama. Her father was a man named Arthur Henley Keller, and her mother was named Catherine Everett Keller, but she was mostly known as Kate. Helen's family lived on a gorgeous homestead named Ivy Green, burrowed under a canopy of, what else? English Ivy. Ivy Green was a sprawling 640-acre property built by David and Mary Fairfax Moore Keller, Helen's grandparents. Grounds consisted of a large main house, a cottage, endless gardens, an outdoor kitchen, and a fountain, eh, you know, amongst other things, but it's nothing fancy, just a humble, humble home tucked in uh, the Alabama countryside. Helen had two full siblings, both younger than her, Mildred and Philip. She also had two older half-brothers from her father's first marriage, James and William. Helen's early years in the American South were formative, set up a lifelong dichotomy between her public and private identity. You see, Helen's father had served in the confederate army yeah you didn't think that gigantic homestead was uh just a regular one did you although he later worked for a local newspaper obviously confederate army didn't last super long her mother a traditional southern belle 20 years his junior was a daughter of the confederate general charles w adams family came from the pre-american civil war slaveholding upper class however they would lose a bulk of their fortune during the war meaning that they were living modestly by the time Helen came around, save for their extravagant property. Uh, yeah, so, you know, super big house, sprawling acreage, not a lot of money, but still, you know, they had that. So, later in life, spurred by the differences caused by her disabilities, Helen would place herself as a as staunchly opposed to the radical ideology of her southern background. In the 1800s, when vaccines weren't so commonplace, children offers often succumbed to diseases such as measles, mumps, and rubella. In her early life, Helen was 
fully able-bodied. She even uh, she was even noted as being a precarious child. She started speaking at six months and was able to walk by one. However, in February of 1882, when Helen was just 19 months old, she became sick with an acute congestion of the stomach and brain. Modern doctors surmise that uh, Helen's sickness could have been about of scarlet fever, meningitis, or both. Afflictions can be... Uh, be treated with antibiotics today, but at the time, this was not an option. Another theory that Helen caught about of hemophilus influenzae, a particular a particular virulent strain of influenza. However, as it was a particularly deadly strain that resulted in a 95 or 97 percent infant mortality rate at the time, it was highly unlikely that she had contracted this illness and survived. Local doctor who treated Helen was convinced that she would, in fact, not survive. However, eventually. Helen's fever broke. She was soon in the clear, so to, see, so to speak. Within a few days after Helen's fever broke, Helen's mother began to notice something was, you know, off with her, with her daughter. Helen did not respond to the dinner bell when it was rang and uh, seemed to have no reaction when a hand was waved in front of her face. Poor Helen had effectively become deaf and blind as a result of her sickness. In her autobiography, she muses about this time as feeling a, at sea in a dense fog. She's also quoted as saying that she had uh, thought that the sun had set and it was simply taking a long time to rise. What a what a childlike thought. Kind of wholesome in a way. Anyway, at first Helen would cling to her mother, afraid to venture off by herself, but soon she began walking around using her hands in lieu of her eyes. It is said, as she grew from infancy to childhood, Helen became wild and unruly. She was refer referred to by her family as being a little monster. She would sometimes throw objects, pinch people. Some later cin cinematic depictions of her at this time rightfully portray her as a child who, is, who tyrannized her household with temper tantrums. <laughs> I'm thinking of one specific example. I think it was the 90s version, 90s movie. That kid, that, that girl who played her did a great job. This is quite normal and expected in a child who is almost likely deeply frustrated that her needs could not be seamlessly communicated. These tantrums were hard to understand for the Keller family and soon they realized that they would have to seek out some outward assistance. Helen was noted as being an exceptionally bright early on. She would communicate successfully with, you know, with the daughter of the family cook, a young girl named Martha Washington who was just two years older than her. Helen's mother Kate was also uh, diligent in trying to communicate with her daughter. By the age of seven, Helen was able to communicate using 60 home signs. As a sidebar, a home sign is when a deaf child is driven to use crude hand gestures to express themselves within the family unit. This typically happens when the child is not ex exposed to deaf community or standardized way of signing. So basically made up signs like <laughs> instead of the typical ASL signing. Helen's mother, who was only 23 years old at the time, doted heavily upon Helen, who was her first child. Kate Keller inherently knew that her daughter was exceptionally bright. In 1886, inspired by the travel notes of Charles Dickens, she urged her husband to seek out assistance from professionals regarding Helen's condition. You see, Dickens' notes, titled American Notes, detailed how a certain school in Boston had successfully educated a young deaf-blind woman. That's right, she's not the first, so. <laughs> so it was with this in mind that Helen was sent to a physician, Dr. J. Julian Chisholm. Dr. Chisholm was an ENT specialist in Boston and Keller sought him out for uh, advice regarding her condition and what possibilities there were for her future. Chisholm maintained that medically nothing could be done for Helen as her eyesight could never be restored. However, he did think that she could be taught how to communicate more effectively with the people around her. Chisholm referred to the Keller family to none other than Alexander Graham Bell of the telephone fame. Bell was uh, passionate about working with deaf children as his mother and wife were both deaf. He'd actually met his wife while tutoring her sign language. I kind of find that hilarious. Uh, the man who is credited with the telephone, a device used to listen slash speak to people at great distances, marries a lady who cannot hear. I mean, good for him, obviously, but it, it's a little funny, if not ironic, right? Anyway, when Bell met Helen, they had an immediate rapport, and he would uh, become one of her lifelong friends. He referred to the Kellers to the Perkins Institute for the Blind in Boston, founded in 1829, as the old, oldest institution of its kind. The Perkins Institute had the distinction at the time of, of providing the most advanced English language education to a deaf-blind child named Laura Bridgman, who was from that book. Twenty years prior to Helen contemplating a foray into formal education, she had successfully been able to learn how to write. Prompted by this, Helen's father had reached out to the director of the school, a man named Michael Anagnus, and asked if he if it would be possible for them to send over someone to help them. As part of her budding education, Helen was assigned a tutor, 20-year-old recent graduate and star pupil of the Perkins Institute, 
named Anne Sullivan. Anne was visually impaired, having suffered a bout of trachoma as a child. In her autobiography, Helen refers to the day she met Anne, March 3rd, 1887, as her soul's birthday. Anne was to be Helen's instructor, but their relationship would evolve into lifelong companionship. Anne's upbringing lied in contrast to Helen's. She was daughter of poor Irish immigrants and had spent four years as a ward of the state at the Tewksbury Alms House in Massachusetts prior to completing her education at the Perkins Institute. Anne was 14 years older than Helen when she began working with her. Her vision was partially restored at the time, but she had endured many botched surgeries in order to get to that point. When she first arrived at Ivy Green, Anne realized that Helen's family had been enabling some poor behavior in in her. For instance, while at breakfast one morning, Helen reached out to grab Anne's plate. When Anne pushed her hand away, Helen had a full-on temper tantrum. She kicked and screamed, threw herself on the floor, and calmly asked Helen's family to exit the room. Helen then got up and reached for Anne's plate again and again, and Anne calmly pushed her hand away. Helen threw another fit before finally setting in to it was evident to Anne that Helen's parents, ill prepared for the education of a deaf blind child, had been system systematically giving in to Helen's whims, which makes sense, you know. <laughs> You're just trying to give the child what you can like you know that this is what she wants because she's grabbing at it. Like, okay, we can give her that. For the purpose of Helen's future, Anne realized that she would have to isolate Helen. Benevolently, of course. As such, she placed Helen in a carriage and pretended that the two of them were going somewhere place far away. This was a ruse. As merely a week after arriving, Anne and Helen moved, quote unquote, into the cottage on Ivy Green's grounds, and they lived there together in order to focus on Helen's education. Helen, thinking she was far away from her family, had no choice but to give in to this educational system. Anne's approach to Helen was one of compassion, love, and discipline. Remember, Helen was a bit spicy at times, but Anne approached Helen with calmness and benevolent sternness, and more importantly, she did not give up on her. She began to teach Helen that each object had letters attached to it by spelling out words in the palm of her hand. This first word, she used was doll using her fingers and traced the letters d-o-l-l -L into the palm of helen's hand and then handed her a doll so that she had brought uh, that she had brought helen as a gift helen's progress was steady she was learning to associate objects with letters but did not comprehend right away that the letters were spelling words that you know sign signified the object in her biography helen reflects on this time like, i did know I did not know that I was spelling a word or even that words existed. I was simply making my fingers go in a monkey-like imitation. A month after arriving at Ivy Green on April 5th, 1887, Anna was attempting to dissipate the confusion that Helen displayed between the nouns mug and water, which she was apparently confusing with the verb drink. Now, just to note, some source materials cite the word milk instead of water. There's also some sources that state that Helen threw the mug on the ground and it shattered. Anyway. Instead of being discouraged, Anne was inspired. She led Helen to the water pump outside, let the cool water run over the little girl's hand. As she did so, Anne traced the, wa the word water, W-A-T-E-R, over and over on Helen's hand. This moment was pivotal for Helen as it was when signals first converted into meaning inside her mind. In her autobiography, Helen recalls the moment as feeling a return of misty con consciousness as something forgotten, a thrill of returning thought. As you'll soon piece together, it turns out our Helen, despite her disabilities, was incredibly gifted with language. And this quote that I just had was also well, really great because it reminds us that, you know, Helen, although deaf and blind, was, had a rich inner world and when she found her voice, as it were, she was able to convey her own thoughts in her own right instead of having other people tell her words, show her how to write, speak, you know, and so on. Now, it is reported that she was then flooded with understanding and curiosity and apparently threw herself onto the ground clamoring for the word earth, clamoring for the word earth by nightfall. Helen had learned over 30 words to describe the world around her. It is also reported that she even began to add dozens of words for her vocabulary every day. Helen quickly learned the alphabet. She was able to master uh, the standard manual alphabet as well as the raised print that is commonly used in it to aid in blind persons today. She also learned how to read and write. Helen's temper tantrums began to dissipate. With her increasing knowledge came an increased sense of being understood. By that time, by the time that she was nine years old, Helen was reading works by literally literary greats such as Shakespeare and Mary Shelley placed her academically as more advanced than children her age. You know, and it makes sense that when she was able to finally convey the things that or understand things around her, her emotional meltdown started to slow it's like watching a dog when you when you're trying to explain like you're trying to give a command and the dog's like 
I don't know what's going on. Like, they, like, shift around. They're really confused. And eventually, they do the command that you want. You give them a treat. And they're like, oh, okay. And then they start doing it a bunch. Obviously, Helen's not a dog. But, like, th that's the closest I can get to, like, teaching somebody. Because I've never been around kids long enough to, like, see the progress of how they're learning. So, I can't, like... I can't think in that way, but I can, you know, I've been around dogs watching them learn stuff and I'm sure parents, you've seen your child start to grasp concepts and you're like, oh yeah, they're getting it now. I mean, <laughs> infants, child, uh, toddlers, they do throw fits, but how often is the fit thrown because they can't properly explain how they're feeling, you know? Anyway, <laughs> tangent aside. By 1890, Helen expressed a desire to learn how to speak. Shortly after, accompanied by Anne, she began to, uh, she began speech classes at Horace Mann School for the Deaf in Boston. She took some classes with a woman named Sarah Fuller. Sarah placed Helen's hand over her mouth, allowing her to feel the sound that she made when she spoke. She encouraged Helen to copy the movements using her own mouth while emitting a sound. After an hour or so, Helen would say her first sentence, it is warm. The sound produced by her unused vocal cords was hoarse, but it was, you know, uh, a considerable moment nonetheless. In addition to this, Helen regularly visited the Perkins Institute alongside Anne. You see, Anne was in the mid mindset that Helen should make friends with fellow deaf and blind people her age. In 1891, Helen wrote a short story called The Frost King, which she then gifted to the director of Perkins, Michael and Agnes, as a birthday present. Deeply impressed, and Agnes got the story published in a magazine called The Mentor. He was attempting to use it as attraction as traction for the school, dubbing Helen as the new Laura Bridgman. This backfired spectacularly as the story ended up creating more scandal than praise. It is more or less implied that the story was plagiarized. You see, there was a book already in circulation called The Frost Fairies by Margaret Canby. The plot of the book the plot of the book was eerily similar to Helen's written book, as believed since Helen had become you know, a voracious reader that she likely assimilated Canby's story and was any, unable to differentiate between Canby's work and her own imagination. It was later revealed that the worker uh, that a worker at Parker's Institute had read the Frost Fairies to Helen in the years in a year the year prior. It was a shocking twist. And Agnes had held a committee to rule whether or not. Helen had committed plagiarism. With him casting the tie-breaking vote, this mock trial deeply traumatized Helen. Later in life, she would state that she was ob she would obsessively check her sentences over and over in order to make sure that they were her own. Uh, Helen Keller and Anne Sullivan cut ties permanently with the Perkins Institute after this whole ordeal. Helen was always determined to receive an education. For two years between 1894 and 1896, she attended the Wright Humason School for Deaf in New York where she began studying objects while continuing the, to work on her communication skill. Anne Sullivan moved, moved to New York in order to accompany Helen during her studies. Helen had her sights set to speak, so to speak, on uh, grander things. Helen wanted to go to college. In 1896, she attended Cambridge School for Young Ladies at a uh, preparatory college for women, learning under the tutelage of a man named Arthur Gilman, named Arthur Gilman. However, Helen ultimately had designs uh, on Radcliffe College, which was part of Harvard University. This was essentially the woman's department of Harvard at the time. In 1900, she was admitted to the prestigious school where she would uh, even serve as class vice president, although she struggled in subjects like mathematics. She was truly gifted in in English. Early on, early on, her professors even encouraged her to write her life story. As such, while undertaking a full undergrad degree, Helen was also writing a manuscript. No small feat. During this time, Helen's story began gaining a bit of cultural traction and was somewhat known in certain circles. For example, Helen had an admirer in Mark Twain of Tom Sawyer fame. He actually went as far as to say as the two most interesting characters of the 19th century are Napoleon and Helen Keller. Hey, talk about a fangirl. Uh, also, Napoleon. <laughs> we just talked about that guy. Maybe we need to do Mark Twain here soon. Anyway, besides waxing poetically about her to anyone who would listen, Twain also introduced Helen to oil magnate Henry Huddleston Rogers, who took it upon himself to pay for Helen's schooling. Because, remember, although Helen's family originally came from wealth, they lost a majority of, it, of their fortune in the Civil War, retaining only their property and broader ideologies, I guess. <laughs> in 1904, Helen graduated cum laude from Radcliffe with a Bachelor's of Arts. She was the first deafblind person to accomplish this feat. However, let us not forget that all through her schooling, Anne was still diligently by Helen's side. As a matter of fact, Anne, who you'll remember is visually impaired, reported, reported, reportedly suffered greatly from reading all the course material, when which she then painstakingly signed into Helen's hand. Imagine. It's quite a display of dedication, if I do say so myself, you know. One cannot discount Anne Sullivan in this tale. She truly is an unsung hero of this story. Also, 
I feel like she probably should have got a degree also. <laughs> I, I didn't look into it, but you'd think if she's reading everything to her, explaining it to her, then she should probably get something. I don't know. Ellen, by this time, was able to communicate in many ways. She was familiar with the Todoma method in which she would touch another person's lips and throat in order to piece together what they were saying, which sounds very intimate. She could also type, read braille, fingerspell, and speak out loud. Helen, it turns out, was also able to write, but her skills were beyond the regular day-to-day -day pros of an average Joe. No, Helen was never average. Helen was a writer through and through, and her, early in her university career, she had developed a correspondence with an Austrian philosopher and pedagogue, as you do, named Wilhelm Jerusalem. <laughs> That's an amazing name. That's like a biblical porn star name. Anyway, he's noted as being one of the first to take stock in her literary talent. In the same year that she graduated, 1904, Helen purchased a home in Rentham, Massachusetts. In 1905, Ann Sullivan married a man named John Macy, and the two moved in with Helen in the Rentham house. Just normal stuff. <laughs> Just living with my bestie. It appears that Helen and Anne's relationship was fusional for both, as they were, you know, seldomly apart. Anne and John helped Helen put together her first book, an autobiotic an autobiography titled The Story of My Life, famously turned into a song by S Social Distortion. The book chronicles Helen's life from childhood up to her uh, time in college at, at the age of 21. By this time in her life, Helen was world-renowned and she was becoming very in-demand person for speaking engagements. Shortly after this, Helen begins a career chairing various organizations that champion the cause related to her disability. In 1906, for instance, she was appointed to the Massachusetts Commission for the Blind. Two years later, her second book, The World I Live In, was published. She also worked towards developing a uniform system of braille, which, by the way, is the writing system in place today, which allows visually impaired people to read and write through touch. She also championed nationwide her larger social issues. For example, in 1910, <sighs> In Terry Hot, Indiana, I'm I'm not confident in how to pronounce that, but she expressed her opposition to prohibition, stating that poverty caused drinking, not the reverse. In 1914, a woman named Polly Thompson joined the Rentham House. She was hired to keep house as Anne Sullivan's health was beginning to fade around this time. Coincidentally, it was also around this time that Anne and John separated as a couple. Anne was always extremely devoted to Helen and it is believed that her marriage crumbled under the weight of that relationship or at least the place that it took in her life contributed to its de-evolution. Helen, for her part, rounds out the year by funding uh, American Foundation for Overseas Blind, which supported World War I veterans who were blinded by the war. The organization would later be known as the Helen Keller International, and it would be devoted to research in health, vision, and nutrition. Many depictions of Helen Keller place her as a saintly, almost asexual being. However, true disability advocacy requires viewing non-able-bodied people as you know, well, people, people capable of love, romance, marriage, and long-lasting relationships. In 1916, Helen met a man named Peter Fagan, a fingerspelling specialist and journalist. Peter Fagan was also, gasp, a socialist. But guess what, folks? So is Helen. Our girl had, in fact, become a member of the Socialist Party in 1909. As we touched upon earlier, her public life was very different from the private life she was born into. Helen was a staunch activist for the working class. She also funneled a lot of her prolific writing into the advancement of women's rights, such as the right to vote, you know, real small stuff, and chronicled the efforts of war on the populace. In her support of the causes of the workers' rights, she joined the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, back in 1912, whereupon she wrote how disabilities often result from the overall lamentable working conditions that were thrust upon society's poorest laboring individual. As a gifted writer, she saw it as her duty to use her unique position to advocate for the working class, a period that she was active in called the Progressive Era, and it was a time of rapid industrialization. As such, the safety of workers was often overlooked, and many were blinded by workplace incidences and accidents. What's more, factory owners and and managers were rarely held accountable for these accidents. Helen also corresponded with Eugene V. Debs, a uh, socialist labor organizer who ran for president repeatedly. Helen was also a suffragist, a suffragist, and a staunch outspoken advocate for women's rights, stating that this inferiority of women is man-made. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That should be on a t-shirt. Uh, would you would you buy a t-shirt from a podcast ran by a dude if it was if it, if it said that? Uh, she was also a proponent of birth control, which was highly unusual and progressive for the time. 
Helen also lent her skills to the pacifist movement. In 1916, she wrote and delivered a speech denouncing the war. At the time, the United States was still neutral, but there were rumblings of preparation for invasion. As such, Helen urged workers not to engage with the wartime machine, more or less. More or less saying that the government's interests ultimately lied with their investments as opposed to their people. For Helen, activism came easy. As a disabled person, she could sympathize and overall and see overall themes repeated in social ill treatment of others. This was the climate of injustice that fueled, fueled her. For Helen, you could not advocate for disability rights without folding in other forms of injustice like racism and sexism. Helen was often typecast as a virginal young woman who miraculously learned to spell and read despite it all. But she was much more than that. She was a self-aware person who landed on the radar of the FBI for her open far left associations in helen's own words blindness with a big b has never interested me what i say of the blind applies equally for all hindered groups the deaf the impoverished mentally disturbed and my desire is to help them regain their human right during this time helen published a collection of essays titled out of the dark detailing her political views now we must take a pause here in order to touch upon a rarely highlighted but nevertheless very cr real critique of Helen Keller's disability rights advocacy. Helen was once a supporter of eugenics. Not great. Uh, this is the school of thought that sought to improve the human population by effectively breeding out certain traits, like for example people with disabilities. Earlier in her writing career, she wrote about her concerns about the feasibility of children with severe disabilities living in society. Later in life, her stance on eugenics would change, and Keller apologists would say that she would be mortified not to have advocated for all human life. In the same year that she met Peter Fagan, Helen donated money to the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, as she was ashamed of the Southern unchristian treatment of colored people that's a quote that quote extracted from kim e nielsen's treatise on helen's southern upbringing and how it would and how it affected much of her worldview helen was an early member of the naacp and she openly condemned lynching as well as racism against african americans altogether must be said that this was highly atypical at the time especially for somebody literally born on you know an acreage in Alabama like shortly after the Civil War to a family whose patriarch was in the Confederate Army like I don't know I don't know how often that happens where the daughter of a Confederate soldier <laughs> it just defects completely but that's it, kind of interesting now back to Helen's love life Peter would communicate with Helen using finger spelling <laughs> I bet he did. I bet he did. And the two fell in love while he served as a secretary while Anne was ill. Come on. That that joke has to be made. There's no way to not make that joke there. Deal, deal with it. <laughs> Without informing her family or perhaps more tellingly, Anne, Helen, and Peter made plans to elope. Helen's family simply did not see marriage and childbearing in Helen's future as she was a deafblind woman. Eventually, she relented to her family's will and abandoned the prospect of marriage, stating in another one of her memoirs that her quote-unquote love life a uh, love dream was shattered. In 1919, Helen would make a hard pivot towards the world of the vaudeville. That's right, a girl was in showbiz. She had starred in a silent film called Deliverance, not that one. Uh, God, that movie would be so, so vastly different. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm talking about the 70s, <laughs> it's just, uh, the 70s Burt Reynolds movie. Anyway, in 1919, she starred in Deliverance, which was incidentally about her life. So she started in a biopic about herself, which, you know, is still pretty cool. Helen's vaudeville career would span over five years. Now, Helen had been offered a vaudevillian act uh, before in her teenage years. However, she had turned it down. The lecture circuit, however, wasn't the most financially fruitful, nor, it turns out, were the, her uh, treaties on the political and social issues at the time. As such, she and Anne agreed to perform on vaudeville circuit, accepting a tour at, on the uh, Orpheum circuit, which would take them all over the United States and Canada. Tour ran from February 1920 until 1924, and it was a huge success. This particular bout of Helen's life would be studied later through the lens of academia. Some would find it point some would find pointed connections or at least a fine line between the vaudeville act and certain elements of the freak show, you know arguing that the show capitalized on Helen's physical differences from the status quo to garner an audience. Either way, Helen and Anne had by, by now developed a 
ease at performing in public and made easy money by performing bits about Helen's life publicly. The vaudeville act would uh, would see Helen make even more famous friends like Charlie Chaplin. I've heard of him. This, however, did not deter Helen from her activism. In 1920, she co-founded the American Civil Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU, an organization which we now broadly associate with the concept of free speech. ACLU's aim to defend the rights and liberties of individuals in the United States, often advocating for the underrepresented folks in marginalized communities. In 1921, Helen decided to shift her primary focus from political activism to raising funds for American Foundation for the Blind. This was a cohesive way for her to center her advocacy work. She raised money, awareness, and support for the blind, and even spoke before Congress. It wouldn't be the last of her feats, Helen in time would be would befriend a lineage of American presidents from Grover Cleveland to Lyndon B. Johnson. In 1943, she visited 73 Army and Naval hospitals in the United States. It's also around this time that Helen, Ann Sullivan, and Polly Thompson all moved to Forest Hills in Queens, New York. This would be her home base for extensive fundraising tours for the American Foundation for the Blind. The relationship between the three m women was fraught at first with inferences that Polly fell out of place in light of Helen and Ann's unique bond. Yeah, it's kind of hard to third wheel that operation. In 1946, Helen was appointed as the counselor of international relations for the American Foundation of uh, for the Overseas Blind. As part of this position, she traveled to 35 countries on five continents and met many world leaders such as Winston Churchill and Golda Meir. Golda Meir. Helen was also a civilian diplomat. She would travel to Japan twice, once in 1937 and another time in 1948. As a goodwill ambassador. 1948, she toured over 30 cities, including the ruins of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. She met with Japanese Emperor Hirohito, and over 2 million Japanese citizens came out to see her. For the residents of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this was seen as a US backed attempt at atonement. This encouraged General Douglas MacArthur, who had sent her to improve US Japanese relations. No small feat indeed. So back in 1901, Ann Sullivan had struffer, suffered a stroke. Back in 1901, and Sullivan had suffered a stroke, which robbed her of what little vision she still possessed. As such, she was completely blind for the later part of her life. On October 15th, 1936, Anne suffered a coronary thrombosis and fell into a coma. Five days later, she died holding Helen's hand. This event, as we can imagine, greatly affected Helen, who was consumed with grief. Helen described Anne as her other self and owed a great deal to her. Helen's life would have never panned out the way it did if it hadn't been for the dedication, love, and discipline of Anne Sullivan. Sounded a little like uh, like an old school, why did I read her name in like such an old school news reporter? <laughs> and Anne Sullivan. It cannot be understated that although Helen Keller was no doubt bright, Anne Sullivan was instrumental in unlocking her genius. After Anne's death, Helen and Polly moved to Westport, Connecticut to a home named Arkin Ridge which sounds like a villain base, um, but it would also be uh, remain Helen's home for the rest of her life. There, Helen made friends with local artists, one of them being sculptor Joe Davidson. In 1950, Joe toured France and Italy with Helen and Polly. Under Joe's guidance, Helen would run her fingers over some of the world's most famous sculptures, delighting in them. Wait, she was allowed to do that? <laughs> I guess this is in the 50s. Nobody, maybe, maybe there was less restrictions back then i don't know i mean if you have the opportunity to touch if you have the opportunity to touch a world famous sculpture i say do it i'm not gonna lie i touched a jackson pollock painting at the <laughs> jocelyn museum in omaha one time it's the best day of my life <laughs> In 1953, Helen visited the Middle East where she toured Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Israel for a period of three months. During this trip, she advocated for the rights of the blind and disabled. Helen was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize in 1954 for this work. Although she did not win the prize, there are some enduring legacies tied to her work during that campaign. One of her feats, for example, is the fact that she secured a promise from Egypt's Minister of Education to create a secondary schools for blind children that would allow them a chance to pursue higher education, which is pretty cool. In 1955, at the spry age of 74, Helen undertook the most grueling trip ever. This trip was a 40,000 mile tour through India, Pakistan, Burma, and the Philippines. This South Asian campaign undertook undertaken on behalf of the American Foundation for the Overseas Blind was intended to inspire the expansion of facilities for the deaf and blind throughout the region. During Helen's later life world travels, Polly Thompson had been her constant travel companion. Sadly, Polly died on March 21st, 1960, after 46 years spent by Helen's side. She was noted as having a single-minded 
dedication for help. It is actually quite fascinating how two women fuse their entire lives together. First, Anne would be known colloquially as teacher, the woman responsible for coaxing out Helen's greatness, and second, Polly, the steadfast secretary as the manager of Helen's time and her many correspondences, a devout travel companion who bestowed deep protectiveness over her dearest friend. Now, in 1961, Helen had suffered a series of strokes that limited her overall capacities. However, she campaigned for the blind and deaf actively until 1962, after which she retired peacefully at Arkin Ridge and led, led a quiet life. In 1964, President Lyndon B. Johnson awarded Helen the Presidential, Mer the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. For many years, she was regarded as one of the greatest uh, living women in America. On June 1st, 1968, Helen Keller died peacefully in her sleep just a few weeks shy of her 88th birthday. Helen Keller's legacy expands far greater than overcoming the obstacles laid before her by her blindness and deafness. Although she is, you know, most commonly known for being able to read, write, and speak against all odds and consequently advocate for people with disabilities, Helen also used her innate mastery of words to stir up discussion around race, women's rights, workers' rights. She was a socialist, a suffragist, a pacifist, among other things. Conversations about the lesser known and more radical advocacy work undertaken by Helen Keller are directly tied to her disability, as most depictions of her stem from early childhood where she was made out to be a feral child transformed into an intellectual. It is easy for the common cultural conversation around her to infantile infantilize her, i.e. Helen Keller, the child who learned to speak despite it all. However, shining light on her other achievements help shed that portrayal and give us pause to admire her for her complexities and ideals as well. Today, Helen's likeness is stamped onto on a state quarter of Alabama, one of many lasting tributes to her. Interestingly, the coin shows Helen dutiful reading a braille book, and although this this feat is mountainous in its, in its extent, it certainly does not represent the full scope of her impact and more radical aspects of her personality. As a sidebar, the picture of her reading the book bears the inscription Spirit of Courage below, and as Professor uh, Georgine Cleage uh, of UC Berkeley says in one interview that I watched. So in some sense, we are supposed to understand that a woman reading a book represents courage. Part of what makes her story so important is the fact that she centered her humanness. She was a person with disabilities, yes, but she was also a person who was once in love, a person who struggled to make money, who clamored for purpose, a performer, and also someone who strayed from the path sometimes, you know, eugenics. In our modern era, conspiracy theories seem to abound endlessly. Helen Keller, of all people, has actually come under fire as a as part of a conspiracy relating to the idea that she was, in fact, a fraud. In a shockingly ableist twist, some TikTokers have actually posted videos that suggest that Helen Keller faked her disabilities, that her success as an author, motivational speaker, and activist was part of some huge grift. Uh, this idea was espoused in May 2020 under the hashtag, hashtag, hashtag Helen Keller wasn't real. What's interesting about this little slice of cultural history is that it does is that it does portray just how real the need for disability awareness and and justice is still is to this day helen's success wasn't so vast that it couldn't possibly be true that she was disabled is the message that comes across kind of like how the tv show ancient aliens would rather surmise that aliens built the pyramids as opposed to a whole ancient civilization of you know not white people this also underscores all the other people who have the exact same disability there's a woman who i found who's a lawyer and is deaf blind she even she, like she speaks there's you can watch the video on youtube she talks perfectly like better than me honestly i think people just don't like to admit when they don't understand slash can't hop can't comprehend something it's easier to say oh helen faked it no no way she learned how to do anything without being able to see or hear hopefully this episode dispelled any major doubts but if not i can't help you <laughs> if you think helen and 160 million people around the world are faking it just for clout then i don't know what to tell you some of the interesting things uh from this episode uh helen keller eugenics who would have thought i mean it's kind of wild you know at some point in her life helen openly agreed with eugenics she did pedal back on the issue pretty quickly but her writings are proof that she did have those thoughts at some point you know and <laughs> on this fact i can't help but wonder if it's a little like not self-defeatist but you know self-loathing like i don't think people with disabilities should be born because like they, i know what what's happened like i get it <laughs> but that's just me putting thoughts into somebody else's head i don't think that's what her message is that's just a hypothetical also some um 
some disability activists, uh, some African-American disability activists, such as Anita Cameron, think of Helen as not being radical, but just being another privileged white person, albeit with the disabilities, is a direct quote. Uh, Cameron was part of a disability movement. She, alongside fellow activists, crawled up Capitol Hill in order to raise an awareness for disability access. This is known as the Capitol Crawl. Historically, folks like her receive little attention, whereas, you know, a white woman like Helen gets a lot of attention. And you know what? I... I wonder if Helen, you know, would have been around a little longer or if she, somehow she managed to live to be 150 years old. <laughs> she's uh, she's hanging around still today. I bet she would probably agree. You got to remember, Helen Keller was daughter of a Confederate soldier who lot whose family lost a bunch of money they lost I'm not saying they didn't lose enough or they lost too much but they lost a lot of their money their money and were left with still a gigantic property and you know helen probably had uh heard uh, well she didn't hear but she was probably told some things later in life you know when her parents were able to communicate about the plight that they were left following the civil war or maybe Maybe that uh, because she couldn't hear them, it was best. Maybe that did help her was she didn't have to learn from them. I don't know. It is interesting to think about, but I hope you like this episode. I really enjoyed learning about Helen Keller. This, you know, it really, it really did take me back to elementary school. I remember learning about her. I remember learning about watching the movie. I don't think we watched The Miracle Worker in school, but I remember watching that and what a great, like great movie. I think that a lot of people, especially the ones who... Uh, sympathize with the conspiracy theory that you know they they can't comprehend what's going on like just kind of miss the basic fundamentals of how learning takes place like it's not that complicated to eventually figure out that she just took word association or letter association with sensations like the simple fact of water running over her hand and then S Anne Sullivan going like saying the same thing over and over, over and over, over and over, like making that connection, you know? <laughs> I hate to bring it back to this example, but when you are like training a, a dog or, you know, a, like when you're doing training, word identification is super important. Saying ball, ball, ball to emphasize that this is a ball, you know, um, to connect these things with like is it, obviously it's not a super easy process but it is possible like i don't know <laughs> i don't i don't like that example either i don't i'm not comparing helen keller to a dog but i think maybe maybe i'm just speaking out of turn i don't know <laughs> anyway so i hope hope this has been you know helpful and it'll enlightening illuminating other great words next week's gonna be a really uh, a really big change of pace next week we have the uh the murders at the hinterkaifeck farm in bavaria uh bavarian farm in what is germany in 1922 uh, a family plus their maid are all murdered in grisly fashion and then nobody knows what happened it's pretty interesting stuff uh, i don't want to give too much of it away but god it is dark um it is pretty pretty crazy and i think it's the perfect one to to post on halloween week i'm very excited so please you know tell your friends share this all over the place do all the things remember to rate and review us at all place possible all places possible that helps greatly if you want to check out the merch got some cool stuff in there Maybe some Helen Keller inspired designs maybe in the future. Who knows? Uh, check out my other podcast, West of Nowhere. Me and my buddy Shane and we talk about things happening in the world and discussing the world's problems in a less organized fashion than this show. And, and that's it. Thank you for joining me and we'll see you next time. Bye.